at the recent Glasgow meet, I was given a generous gift of three different LED retrofit street lamps by Alan. And this is one of the most interesting, partly because it's faulty. So to put things into perspective, this is a traditional low-pressure sodium lamp. It's a, a vacuum outer tube for thermal insulation with the U-tube inside, which contains liquid metal sodium and a neon gas mix. I think it's a mixture of neon and argon just to get it to the correct sort of ratio because they, they kind of want to heat the sodium up. And it's quite odd to see the sodium actually clustered into one corner here. It's usually set it out into these little dimples around the lamp. The electrodes also look a bit sad, but then again, this lamp is, was originally installed 9-12-2010, so you know what? It's put in some good service. Not sure when it's taken out of service. It, the lamp is actually held in place with a mic... Uh, it's got two bits of uh, mica, one at this end, one at that end, and the one at that end looks really spotty and grubby. I wonder what's happened there. I can see bits of glass in here as well, but I can't see any obvious damage to the lamp itself. Not sure. I shall investigate this later on. Other things worthy of note are the sort of getters in here and the, uh, there's more than one. There's one actually pressed into the mica. It's quite interesting. Interesting lamps. Very interesting in the sense that to stop the uh, sodium attacking the glass, there's a special coating inside. There's a lot of science behind these. But to put things into a more realistic perspective, uh, these are the old street lamps that used to be that bright, lurid yellow colour. And it, it's quite an annoying yellow colour. It's, it's pretty much monochromatic, very close to the peak spectrum of human sensitivity. So that made the low-pressure sodiums a good choice because they are super efficient. You know, they yield a lot of visible light for per watt. But this is a 35-watt one. This lamp, this dead LED lamp, on the other hand, is a 16-watt one. Other things worth noting, apart from the fact it's about half the power, well, it's over half the power. If you take a look at this, it's got the 1-watt LEDs in it. And this is common. The earliest street lights all tended to use a matrix of 1-watt LEDs, and they were pretty reliable. Uh, what's really interesting about this, it's the first time I've ever seen it, Normally they have a round lens on top. Do I have any in the vicinity of the round lens? I probably do. I know there are some in front of me here, but I can't see them right now. But they normally have a round lens, and then in front of it they have a shaped oval lens to actually spread the light along the road, so that from the side of the road, if, if this bench was the road, and this was a lamp post right here, it wants to just light a narrow section like that, but it wants to light a long section along the road. So normally they use oval lenses to do that. However, on these LEDs, the LEDs themselves have oval lenses. These LEDs are designed to spread the light sideways along the road. Other things worthy of note, the LEDs are in pairs. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pairs of LEDs in parallel, uh, plus those uh, eight uh, circuits are in series, giving about 24 volts, I would guess, across that whole circuit at probably in the region of about 700 milliamp. Does that work out right for the 16 watt rating? I think it does. Uh, let me just calculate that. Let me just... Uh, I'm going to open this up. Uh, it's faulty, by the way. That's why it's got an unhappy face in it. We are going to have a go at repairing this. So I've got, say, 24 volts times guesstimate about 0.7 amps equals there's the 16 watts that's exactly what it is they are running them as one watt leds which is good because these packages are also usually optimal for one watt two three watts but one watts at the lower end of the range which makes it reliable however this lab is not reliable let me plug it into a holder you see, this isn't just a direct retrofit. I believe it's designed to go into the holder and then you bypass the igniter and the ballast inside. The igniter and ballast, I'll cover that one other day. It's quite interesting. It's a standard inductive ballast. The igniter works just by basically shunting the output of the ballast to actually cause a voltage spike to actually strike the lamp. I'm going to plug this in. There's a pause and then it starts going into disco mode because this thing has a bootstrap circuit and all the LEDs do appear to be lit. Uh, I think we should open this up and diagnose what's wrong with this lamp. So being a commercial lamp, it's got a couple of interesting features. It rotates in its metal housing. 
If I hold this bit still, I can rotate this over quite a significant degree, simply so that no matter what way you put it into the lamp holder, you can then angle it down so that it lights down onto the road. And the other end isn't glued or anything, it's just screwed in, not by many threads. It's not, you know, it's quite easy to open, which is nice. Uh, the circuit board is using a, a control chip. I can actually see the control chip in here. Let me zoom down a bit. That's the best bet here. Not too much, though. I think I should still be in focus at this point. Yes. Uh, what I'm seeing in here, the circuit board is glued in. I've already had the end off, so I can see that it's glued in, which is disappointing. Uh, there's the transformer. There is the big transistor that's doing the switching. There's a little tiny six-pin style chip down here that's almost certainly a switch with power supply. Uh, the output of the power supply is going via this diode to this capacitor and then going through a little commode suppression choke, I think. It does have four connections, so I'm guessing it's comm mode suppression to probably try and sort of reduce RF interference. And normally the first suspect here would be this capacitor here because uh, they suffer a lot. The, these, the capacitor on this side has to deal with very high frequencies, so um, it tends to, they tend to use a low, uh, low uh, ESR, low equivalency resistance capacitor, and that... Uh, means are more susceptible, partly by the chemistry and so on, to actually uh, sort of overheating and drying out. So tell you what, will we change that capacitor first? It's a 470 microfarad capacitor rated 35 volt. Hold on, I'll, I'll check if I've got one of those. Big Clive's tub of low ESR capacitors. We're in luck. I have a 470 microfarad, 35 volt. And you know what? It's roughly the same size. That's good. Shall we swap it? Okay, so let's note that the negative is facing towards capacitor. The positive is facing the outside. This is where I have an absolutely terrible time unsoldering it because it's a double-sided board. Or when I unsolder it, I can't clear out the holes. Let's have a go anyway. I notice it's got positions for two capacitors. Other things worthy of note, it's got a little capacitor and resistor network across the rectifier diode and a, what looks like a 33, uh, 33k resistor just across the output to make sure it goes out decisively, I guess, and provides some small load. This circuit board also appears to have a conformal coating on it. That is not desoldering easily at all because it does seem to have a coating. Okay, that's worthy of note. It has protection against the elements. They must have just sprayed the whole thing. Douched it. Okay, this is this is going so badly to start off with. Okay. Let's try and get that capacitor out by just gently rock it that side. Let it cool. Then just gently push in the other direction to rock it the other direction. Then again, the other side. Not the best way to do it. There's multiple ways of doing it. You get the solder irons that are specifically intended for desoldering dual things at once. Okay. Let us use desoldering wick on that with, uh, let's use my proven good desoldering wick uh, with a bit of flux to try and get the solder out of those plated through holes, which is where we're going to have problems probably. Plated through holes are a bit of a nightmare. This is why I usually try and design my circuit boards as single-sided wherever possible. If you can make your circuit board single-sided, that's always a good option. Because that just makes maintenance so much easier in the future. Let's scrub this around. You know what? By Jove, I do believe it's actually sucked the solder out the holes. That's very good. This incidentally is desoldering braid. It says Goodwick. It came from eBay, so it doesn't absolutely guarantee its original Goodwick, but it is standard desoldering braid, and it works really well when with you use a flux pen, also from eBay. Everything's from eBay. I'm so cheap. But the idea here is that this is a copper braid, and when you add a bit of flux to it, and you put it in a solder joint and scrub it about a bit, it acts as a, a sponge that sucks the solder into it and it takes the solder off the joint. Okie dokie. 
Right, I believe the negative was pointing in the way. Positive in the diode has come to the outside, so the positive there, negative to the inside. Let's see if I've cleared enough solder to get my capacitor through. Let's re-solder that capacitor and see if it works. There's no guarantee this is going to fix it because the hiccuping effect may actually also be down to a primary side issue. We'll find out shortly. There's no harm in testing it, is there? So I shall just finish soldering this. I shall crop those leads because that capacitor can stay in there now. And I shall just randomly power it up again. We'll see if it works. I'm not guaranteeing it is going to work because, as I say, that hiccuping can be down to what's called the bootstrap circuit problem. Let's get the lamp holder up. Let's plug it in. And uh, power it up and see if the lamp lights. It's still blinking. That suggests a bootstrap circuit problem. Okay, right. Here is the next angle of attack. I'm going to have to bring the notepad in for this. I'm going to have to show you what I'm looking for here. Notepad. Blindingly white notepad. It's not any longer. And let's focus down onto there. Excellent. So here's the situation. With a typical switch mode power supply, you have the main screen and it gets converted through a direct fire. So that's the... Oh, why, why did I draw a big A? There's the mains. Uh, so we've got, uh, say, live, neutral, and it's AC, and it goes through a bridge rectifier, which doesn't look a bit like an A at all, and it comes out at plus and minus. There's a big smooth capacitor across that, which is usually not a problem. Uh, depending on the type of circuitry, there may not even be a smoothing capacitor, but I can kind of see one just sneaking in the back here. And then the coil... And the transformer goes to, say, positive. Uh, this tiny little transformer here, this thing here. And then there's a transistor that switches it. Let's just draw an ordinary transistor, an NPN type transistor, switch it down to negative. And there's a control circuit that then pulses that at very high frequency. And what it does is it pulses this transformer on and then turns it off. And it does that thousands of times a second. And each time it does it, this little transformer here gets a magnetic field put into it. And when this turns off, the magnetic field then collapses. And normally, in the opposite polarity, when it's collapsing, it then puts current through the diode, which is this big diode here, into a capacitor. And that puts a controlled amount of power out the other side, which then goes to the LEDs. That's a very simplistic drawing. But there's a little bit extra. You see, this circuit here requires its own power supply, and it usually has a resistor which charges the little capacitor up until it provides the power. But then there's an extra winding which uh, is connected between negative and it's got a little winding here on the primary side, and then it goes via a diode over to there. And initially when you power it on, this capacitor charges up through that resistor, and that's the delay. Did you notice when I turned this lamp on, it didn't light instantly? There was a small delay before it lit. That's this capacitor charging up through this high-value resistor, which uh, it's not designed to just run the circuit all the time. If it did, this resistor would have to be quite low value. It would get quite hot. So what happens is uh, it charges up this capacitor, and once it reaches a certain voltage, this chip here kicks in, it starts driving the transistor, the transistor drives the transformer, the output from the transformer charges this capacitor and runs the LEDs, but it also powers this little winding here, and that then also puts current through this diode to this capacitor here. So then it derives its own power supply from switching the transformer. It just means that it's got a, the transformer's doing two things. It's powering the LEDs and output, but it's also powering the circuitry. And what happens if that goes wrong, if there's a break in the windings, or this diode fails, or this capacitor fails, is that the capacitor will charge up, but the circuit will kick in 
and it starts powering it, but it's not getting power from this coil. And uh, that means this capacitor doesn't get charged up, and the voltage goes so low that it kicks out again. When it does that, it starts the whole cycle again. It charges up and kicks and charges up. The other thing that can cause problems with that is if you had a short circuit on this side, and it was just shunting the output of that diode, or if there was too low a load on it, supposing instead of the 24 volts worth of LEDs, it only several had shunted out and it had gone quite low, um, then that's pulling the voltage down across this uh, the output of this coil, which also shunts the transformer. So the voltage across this coil is lower, and it also means it can't start up. Uh, you can't get the voltage high enough to actually reach the point that it can run continually, and it causes that flashing. So looking at this, I can see various components under here. I can see the snubber network. I can see this capacitor here which looks like the bootstrap capacitor with a little diode there. Um, that diode could have failed, or this capacitor could have failed. They're two fairly simple, cheap components. Um, I'm going to see if I can find replacements for those, and we'll change them and see what happens. I've whipped that capacitor out, it's 22 microfarad low ESR. Uh, I've got my generic low ESR capacitors made by Suntan. And I'm going to pop this new one in. So the positive is going down there, the negative is going over there, so positive there, negative there. Let's try this out. In the past, I've noticed uh, a trend of the diodes failing, but uh, we'll find out. I'll put this capacitor in and we'll see if it fixes the problem. I've also been trying out these little uh, through hole sort of pins, if you will. I'm not even sure what the best way to describe these is. They're uh, a set of pins and a sort of key ring type thing that you melt the solder and you place them through. And I don't know why they've got a textured coating on them. And that doesn't really help. I thought if they'd been smooth, it would have been good. But the idea is you melt them, you poke this through, if I'm using them correctly, and it clears the solder out and then you can pull them back out again. That's where the roughness doesn't really help an awful lot when you try pulling them back out again. Let's try this. Other options here, other problems here could be the diode on the bootstrap circuit, because this is the bootstrap capacitor I'm changing. And the other options are the transformer itself maybe has a bad winding. But I've tried testing that in circuit, and it does appear to be pretty much a short circuit across the winding, which is what you'd expect. It's very low resistance winding when you put it in the continuity test. A low impedance winding. Okay, I've changed the capacitor. Is this going to fix it? Let's plug it in again. Let's plug it into the mange and see what happens. Is it going to work this time? Oh, that's a bit uninspiring. What have I done here? That's taking a long time to power up. Oh, it doesn't like that, does it? It doesn't like that at all. Oh, oh, there it goes. So is that the problem? That capacitor, that's why it was taking, it took longer to charge up that this time because the other capacitor must have dried out. It makes me wonder if they'd used an ordinary capacitor for that then. Let's try that again. Let's uh, give it time to discharge, plug it in, and it's taking, uh, it uh, powered up a lot faster that time, but now the lamp is working. And this makes me suspicious that in many instances when they design these, because that's a fairly low value capacitor, are they skimping out on the capacitor on the power supply side? Uh, if I was to go back into the drawing here, it would be this capacitor here. Are they skimpy out not using a low ESR? Because technically speaking, it is getting exactly the same abuse as the one on the other side, but a lower level, uh, because it's being run at the same high frequency. Um, and that would be annoying because that capacitor, well, tell you what, I'm going to find out how much that capacitor cost and we'll see what knocked this light out. One moment, please. That particular capacitor, it's not the most highest quality capacitor, but it came from Rapid Electronics and it cost a total of 40p for five of them. So you could fix five of these lights for 40p. That's kind of that's kind of shame, really, isn't it? It makes me think that I know that many street lighting departments, the councils, are now starting to 
uh, sort of they're maintaining the lights it's at a component level they're having to it's just the nature of led these days let's brighten this up a tad um that you know you have to it's it's an advantage to be able to actually change LED modules and power supplies, things like that, where they're available. Uh, what I'd like to see in the future is modules in streetlights that you can physically swap standardised LED panels. I'm not sure if that will ever happen. Now, if you notice that when I powered this on, there was a slight shimmer. That's the camera picking up that slight ripple. It's the ripple coming through from the main side again. That's a 50 hertz ripple. It's kind of a warm light. It's quite nice. Oh, talking about warm lights, right, for a start. Let's remove its unhappy face because this is now fixed. Let's get the methylated spirits. I'm not drinking methylated spirits. It is, as I film this, it is uh, Sunday morning. Well, I say Sunday morning, it's really early Sunday morning. So uh, I'm going to have just dark and stormy without methylated spirits because we all know what that tastes like. It's awful. Let's get rid of that. The light is now fully operational again. There's a little red dot there that is just not coming out. Okay, that'll do. Now... Alan, who gave me this lamp, also showed me another, and I have to say I was a bit envious of the other lamp. It looked like this, but it didn't have the uh, the shaped LEDs, the elliptical lenses. It had standard one LEDs, and it looked like a sort of golden phosphor in them, and I just thought that it was just warm white. But he says, no, it's sodium yellow, and he sent, sent me a picture of it, uh, showing it lit in his room. And it is indeed a sodium yellow lamp. And the idea is that you can swap these in and people don't know that you've put an LED lamp in because it looks like the original sodium lamp, that lurid yellow colour, uh, but gets that sort of, um, I don't know, I was going to say energy savings. How much did this lamp cost is the question. Who makes this lamp? Sox LED dash 16 watt Magnatech LED. Type SLO7DW16B22, B22 being the Bennett Cap 22, W16, that'll be the wattage, SLO7D, not sure, unless that's based on the original lamp number. AC102, 240 volts, universal, 50, 60 hertz, uh, colour temperature 4500K, do not put in the bin. We flying bird with MT and CE for European compliance. It's a neat enough lamp. It's serviceable, you know. I've just fixed the power supply in that. You could also, theoretically, you could change the LEDs, but, you know, there is a point you have to say, at what point does it become economically viable? Um, I wouldn't mind one of those sodium-coloured ones. If MD works in the street lighting industry and they do perhaps have access to one, it would be quite nice. In fact, all street lighting gadgets would be quite nice. So there we go. It's fixed. It was interesting. And I'm going to finish my dark and stormy. I want to mention that uh, I was just browsing the internet tonight and I discovered that an old ride at Disney that I worked on it 17 years ago, apparently, I worked on a particular ride called Armageddon in Paris. It closed down earlier this year. I'm actually surprised it lasted this long because as rides go, it wasn't really a ride. It was a walkthrough attraction where a spaceship... Uh, a, uh, the space station that you're in blows up around with flames and stuff like that. And I was looking at the videos, uh, and from its earliest days when I was working on it, they were quite ambitious, they had loads of effects, they were kind of, they'd stripped them all back. Um, a lot of the effects just either weren't working, or they'd just proven unreliable. And one that I noticed was missing was that a meteor fires right across where you are. It literally just above head height, this glowing meteor fires across. I wonder if it was just unreliable because it, it followed a, a wire. It was launched across a wire. I wonder if it was just unreliable or people were interfering by reaching up and touching it or something like that. Also, another thing that was supposed to happen was pipes, flexible pipes attached onto the sort of structure were supposed to drop down and dangle. But I'm guessing maybe people pulled them or something like that, or maybe it didn't work. And the reset system in that was that the pipe had a pneumatic ram inside it that when it had dangled down, as the ride reset, the pneumatic ram extended and it pushed the pipe up vertical and then just pushed its magnet onto a sort of magnetic catch. Um, that was missing as well. Um, and the spark projector, I noticed, wasn't always running. Uh, when the collapsing corridor, as part of the uh, attraction, one of the uh, corridors gets hit and the, the ceiling collapses in and it was showers of sparks. But I noticed uh, that wasn't uh, always working out. That was based on a MIG welder. Uh, with the wire feeding out onto a spinning stainless steel drum. Uh, so it shot sparks out, uh, 
on us just basically on demand. It's a common enough effect in the effects industry. But there we go. That was a complete distraction. That had nothing to do with streetlights at all. So uh, thanks to Alan for the lamp he gave me. And uh, I do have another couple down here. Um, this one works, and this one is based on the surface mount LEDs with the... Uh, I'll, I'll light it. That's the best bit. I've just shipped these across to myself, so that's why they're uh, in these covers. Uh, this one is based on the more traditional surface mount type LEDs, but with the lenses on them. Who makes this one? Indo. Is that Indolux? Okay, let's plug this one. Oh, it's bright and it's got that slight shimmer. This camera just picks up any shimmer whatsoever. <clears throat> Quite bright. And this other one is more traditional, I suppose. Is that one got adjustable rotational? Yes, it does. It's got this slight reduced rotation. Uh, this one, does it have rotation? Not really. I think you'd have to rotate the cover because this one has a heat sink here and then it's got three panels of LEDs. Is this one going to shimmer as well? Bit of shimmer. Picking up by the camera. The camera just picks up shimmer and absolutely everything. Uh, not visible to the naked eye. So there we go. It was interesting. It was fun. And that unusual lamp is now fixed. So there we go. Thanks, Alan. They were very interesting lamps. And I'll take a look at these other ones later on. But uh, the most important one was the, the one that was faulty because fixing things is fun.